Hey everyone, welcome to episode two of the Stone and Straw podcast. I am your host, John Cullen. You can find me on Twitter as always at Cullen the Curler. You can follow this podcast on Twitter at Stone Straw Pod. Before we get underway this week, I just want to thank everybody for the amazing feedback after episode one. For those of you, if you haven't listened to it yet, episode one featuring John Morris was a real treat for me to do. And the feedback from you guys has been amazing. I really appreciate it. I know a lot of you have downloaded it. You've streamed it. You've told your friends. You've talked to me. I've gotten messages all week long from people who are listening to the podcast. And I think that's kind of the funny thing about doing podcasts. You know, they're not a quick investment of time, right? Like you... I put it out on Twitter and I'm I'm almost expecting like immediate feedback right away. You know, you post it up, you're like, "Hey, the episode's out," and you just assume that everyone listens to it right away. And podcasts are, you know, usually an hour to an hour and a half of an investment of time. So you start to realize like, "Oh, right, people have lives and it actually takes them a while to catch up with the show." But a lot of you have been sending stuff in all week and and it's meant a lot to me. I have said before, this podcast is a a real passion project for me, a real labor of love. I've been traveling all over to do it, and I'm happy to do that. I feel like I say that every week, like I'm I want some kind of medal for that or something. I don't. I just it's just a true fact, and and it means so much to me to see all of you really liking it and sharing it and leaving reviews on iTunes. We made it to the iTunes chart this week, which is phenomenal. Uh, it's been downloaded over 500 times already, which is just incredible to me. And so I just, I really appreciate everybody that's been, that's been talking it up and and sharing it. And, and like I said, if you haven't listened to the first one yet, finish this one and then go back and listen to the first one. It's great. Uh, this episode as always is brought to you by curling zone, the world's foremost curling website, curlingzone.com. It's also brought to you by Dynasty and Hardline. You're going to hear from them a little later in the show. I just want to say, I think it's pretty awesome that Dynasty is giving a discount to people who listen to this show. Like All you have to do is just listen to this show and you get a discount on Dynasty's off-ice apparel. That's pretty amazing. So be sure to check out, listen to the rest of this show, and you'll, you'll find that information on how to get that later on. Someone I didn't thank last week that I want to thank is Cody Audette. He's the man behind all the graphic design uh, that you see, the the podcast logo, the iTunes, the Twitter header, all that kind of stuff. He's uh, a, a good friend of mine. He's actually a stand-up comedian here in Vancouver. Very funny. Pardon me. And also an excellent graphic designer. So be sure to uh, check him out if you need any graphic design done. He actually did our curling jackets this year which have not seen the light of day yet. And that's my fault. I got them into Colin and and dynasty a little bit late, but uh, we're hoping to have them for our tournament next weekend in Abbotsford. And they're spectacular. I think once you see them, you're gonna be like, Oh my gosh, who designed these? Uh, So be sure to uh, be sure to check Cody's work out. If you ever need anything done, he's the man to talk to. I got to always thank Graham Wright for that amazing theme song you heard off the beginning. And uh, okay, let's just get into this. Let's just get into this episode. This is my preamble. I realized last week I, you know, I talked a lot about the interview with John and I can just talk about whatever I want in this space. So there's a couple things I, I wanted to get to. The The first one is the women of curling calendars back for 2019. If you didn't see that news, I love those calendars. I think it's so great. All the, the cool part is you get to see all the curlers choose a charity, choose something that means a lot to them. And in a lot of cases, they're raising a ridiculous amount of money for these charities. I think I saw Mark Kennedy's up over $50,000 for his charity from last year. So that's just incredible. Uh, So make sure you check that out. That's through the curling news. Uh, Just look it up on Twitter, women of curling calendar. Um, While you're on checking things out, as you know, this podcast is part of the curling zone podcast network. Once you're done listening to this episode, if you're jonesing for some more curling content, uh, check out Two Girls in a Game, the Curling Legends podcast, and From the Hack. They're all part of the Curling Zone podcast network, and they're all excellent at what they do. Uh, so make sure that you check them out. Now, this episode, episode two, is with Chelsea Carey. And um, Chelsea is just an excellent person. I think that's lost, not necessarily lost on a lot of people, but I think that Chelsea gets a bit of a reputation because she's very honest. That's something you're going to see in this interview. Chelsea's very honest. She's very open. And that goes uh, from the media to talking to her teammates, even just the way she presents herself on social media. She always wears her heart on her sleeve. And I, I think sometimes that gets that gets taken in a 
in a way that I don't like and I don't think is accurate. I mean, I've known Chelsea for a long time. I'm a little biased. We've been friends for a long time, but I I always feel like she gets a little bit of an unfair shake from people sometimes. So I talked about that with her in this interview. I asked her a lot of questions about her team this year. We did this interview in Calgary. I actually just interviewed her in her living room. So that was kind of nice. Like I said, there's always a story with all these podcasts and I traveled to Alberta in the summertime to get a bunch of podcast episodes done. And Chelsea was the first name on my list. I just knew that I wanted to talk to her and wanted to give her maybe a chance to talk about some of the things and some of her feelings that maybe she doesn't get to talk to as uh, talk about as much. And so this is a really, uh, a really fun episode. And also too, people have been uh, asking me this week or were asking me, this is a little sidebar, but have been asking me, you know, are you still going to do magical question fun time for curling Canada? And those of you who, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter, you would have seen this week. The answer is yes. I did an amazing interview with Laura Walker, uh, formerly Crocker, and it was just phenomenal. I, I love doing the MQFT interviews. This is my fourth year doing them. They're so fun every time. And Laura was a phenomenal guest. A couple of the stories she told were incredible. So if you haven't given that a read, head on over to curling.ca and check that out. I'll still be doing the MQFTs all year long. So don't worry. Just because I started doing Stone and Straw doesn't mean I abandon you people who love your written content. It's out there. And I also loved what Laura said this week to Devin Haru of um, of CBC. He interviewed her about the, the women's uh, curling calendar. And she obviously married Jeff Walker, the lead for Brad Gushu this summer. And she had some awesome things to say about that. So make sure you check that out too. But enough about Laura, enough about the women of curling calendar. This episode is all about Chelsea Carey. And like I said, just a phenomenal chat with her. So honest, so open. A lot of you said that's what you really loved about the John interview. And I have to say that's what all these have been about so far. I've now recorded six. The the first season is completely recorded and you're going to hear one every Tuesday from now until the middle of November. But All of them have been super open and honest with me, and Chelsea was no exception. I know you guys are going to really like it. So without any further ado, this is Chelsea Carey. This episode is brought to you by Hardline Curling Supplies, and I'm happy that it is brought by Hardline uh, Curling Supplies because... I'm a Hardline Nation member. I've been, my team's been using Hardline for the last five years. We were onto Hardline products before they were even on Dragon's Den. Can you believe that? Ice Pad, it's the most technologically advanced brush on the market. You don't believe me? Seven of the top nine men's teams and 10 of the top 15 women's teams in the world are all using this brush. Kevin Cooey, Brad Gushu, Nicholas Adeen, Anna Hasselborg, Reed Carruthers. Chelsea Carey, Mike McEwen, the list goes on and on. And they're great for the rec curler, too. Don't just think, oh, I club curl. It's not good enough for me. It's phenomenal for you. It helps with your shoulders. You can use it for over 100 games. When your head wears out, you just throw it in the wash and you can use it again. It saves you money. It helps the environment. And they got a lot of great products, too. They've got the best pants. Are you one of those cold curlers who's always complaining about how you're cold? Well, guess what? They've got super comfy and warm pants. They've got great shoes, shirts, helmets, broom bags, whatever you need. And if you were looking for that best delivery aid on the planet, that's Reed Carruthers Pro Slide, which you can get exclusively from Hardline Curling. It's guaranteed for life. Your one-stop shop for all your curling needs. So visit Hardline at www.hardlinecurling.com or go to any one of the 120 Hardline retailers around the world and get your products today. Have you have you ever read your Wikipedia? Uh, I've read, yeah, it changes all the time. I haven't read it recently. Okay, but. so I don't know who like wrote it recently, but it's like very weird. They're obviously like a very big fan <laughs> of you because they, it's like it's almost like they tell it like a like a storybook okay. style because it that like it's they, it's like very in depth. Like a lot of people, it's just like here, are like the straight goods. This is like Chelsea did this and this and this. Yeah, one. This, yours is them. like yeah, yours is like ah, oh, it's a story <laughs> and I'm telling everything. And then um, they also like there was just weird extraneous information. Like they noted that you participated in the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> yes, right. I knew that was on there. Actually, I remember reading that and thinking, how is that relevant? Yeah, you're like, well, so, yeah, okay, you and everyone else like yeah, what a weird didn't participate in the ice yeah. bucket challenge and i don't know why that's relevant but wow. anyway it was very funny but one thing i thought was extremely funny is that apparently your nickname is the annihilator okay, so i learned about that on my wikipedia page <laughs> yeah because i've never been called that in my life and it turns out so for years i didn't know who wrote it or where it came from and it, it turns out it's a guy who 
um, goes to the House of Hearts Bonds bill. Oh, so okay. he, I had met him there or whatever. And he uh, later told me that he had written that and like, he had come up with this nickname for me and written it into my Wikipedia page. And I was like, but it was weird if you like, it's what, cause I had the same conversation when I interviewed Brendan for MQFT because he, he had the same situation. Someone on Wikipedia had written that he was nicknamed the botcher express. <laughs> and he's like, no one's ever called me that in my entire <laughs> life. Like, and then it was really funny after the interview got posted, it got deleted. So like oh. people had obviously like, read MQFT and then yeah. been like, oh, oh we he's should not, take that down. that's he not a real like, like thing yeah. that he wants to be called. And so I just think it's funny. Like, okay, it's one thing to be like, she's nicknamed the Annihilator, but they wrote it like, that's what everyone called you. Like everyone, like everyone in Manitoba was just like, oh, there goes the Annihilator. Oh, and you know what's so funny is that every time somebody researches me, so I go to do random interviews, they're like, oh yeah, I was reading that your nickname is the Annihilator. And I was like, yeah, I, I've never, like, you guys are the first people to ever call me that besides this person that put it in my <laughs> Wikipedia page, but I had no clue where it came from. And then when I finally, when he finally t- came up to me and told me at the House of Hearts the year or two later or whatever it was, I was like, oh. oh okay, I understand. Because it's like, I almost feel like it's embarrassing to have any nickname in curling. Like, I feel like the only nicknames in curling are like, just based on your name, you know, like John Morris, like Johnny Mo, or like Gooshoes, like the Goosh or whatever, you know, like it's not, no one has like a nickname. Well, Kevin Martin, probably the only one the yeah. there. Yeah, that's it. Right. Yeah. I'm like, so I feel like it's almost like if I was reading that, I'd be like, oh my God, that's almost like embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want people to think I'm called the Annihilator. Like, I feel like I would think like people would feel like I wrote it or something. Yeah, I was. Uh, and like I said, I mean, when I got asked about it, I just didn't even know what to say because I I don't write in my own Wikipedia page. And <laughs> what? I, you don't? <laughs> I don't? No. No, I never have. So I, I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody's called me that. I've, I'm unaware of it. If nobody's ever said it to my face, but <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I'm going to start calling you at this year. Very. <laughs> I'm only going to call you Annihilator. It's it's so unwieldy to say, oh, too. Like There's no like say, short. Yeah. Just like It's like seven syllables. It's like, oh, my God. Well, it's even worse to spell. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Oh, my God. Well, thank you, Annihilator, for joining me on Stone and Straw. <laughs> um, I start every interview the exact same way, which is I just ask how you got started in curling. Tell me about it. Um, my parents, when we were kids kind of put us in everything and we were able to pick, uh, what we, what we liked or didn't like or whatever. So one of the things we were put into was curling and my dad was playing pretty competitively already, but what was your dad good at curling? <laughs> Whoa. He, he has one of, he's won the odd bond spiel. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, you know, I, I knew he was playing, but he hadn't, they hadn't won the province or anything yet. And so then I was playing and taking lessons and stuff, but it wasn't until, and we actually were taking lessons from Connie Laliberty. So oh. that was kind of a neat way to start. She Casual, had a curling school. Yeah. yeah. She had a curling school at the time at the winter club, which no longer has curling ice, but did back then. And, um, you know, and my dad knew her and everything else. So it was, that's how my sister and I both got started. But then we, I, I got really interested in it after he won when, cause we were there in Regina at that briar. And so I was just hooked from that moment on. And so what made it like, what made it, what, what hooked you? Like, so obviously you wins. That's a big thing, but what was it something particular about that other than just my dad won a big thing? Well, I think it was like, I, I was interested enough in it already that just watching him win and thinking that it was something that would be like, if he can do it, I can do it kind of a situation right. where before that, I don't know that I ever really thought about what my future in curling, like I was just taking lessons and, you know, going in the odd bond spiel, but I never really thought about like winning the Scotties right. until he did. And then all of a sudden it became this thing that I like, maybe it was I could like do a that. real thing. Yeah. Like, like maybe I could people do that do this. too. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it was that, and it was just the atmosphere in there and watching him do it and just kind of the pride you felt for him and stuff. And then getting to see all the cool stuff you got to do after that. And, right. and just like the, the attention in the media and stuff. I did my first, um, newspaper interview right after they won that. Yes. Final. I heard you were out on the ice and you got, you got in a scrum. Yeah. Well, I, I, the scrum came to me and they, my parents were, they'd lost me. They didn't know. <laughs> How old know. were you at this time? Uh, six. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they looked around and they went, Oh, like <laughs> we lost our daughter. Chelsea go? Yeah. <laughs> and then, then I was so short that you couldn't see me because of the scrum. Right. So eventually they found me in the scrum and I was, there's yeah seven reporters or whatever it was around me. And, I was, they were asking me questions about the worlds and about, cause they had and called like, me their I'm good going, luck charm. I'm doing this. This yeah. is awesome. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. So nice. yeah, just the whole experience of it and, and started to make me sort of think like maybe this is something I could do too. Yeah. And uh, that's nice. I mean, I never really had that, uh, you know, my parents didn't curl, so I never really had that kind of that, 
that realization, I think maybe the closest thing for me was when I won the 50 50 at a hockey at an Arizona Coyotes game. And I was like, whoa, people actually win this. This is like a real thing. I just felt like <laughs> yeah. I just been buying 50 50 tickets for years. And I'm like, it's not, a real, yeah. Yeah, it's not a real person who yeah. wins this Nobody thing. Nobody actually then, wins. Yeah, this. no one wins. And then I won. And I was like, oh my God, people actually win this. This <laughs> yeah. is real. That's so dope. Um, that's cool. So you, so yeah, so obviously you came up and you have a bit of a, I've interviewed a lot of people that their parents curled and their parents curled at pretty high levels, but I feel like in Manitoba, especially when you're really good and you're the daughter of someone who's really good, that get, is known. People know who you are. Like you said, you did an, a scrum after <laughs> he won. So was that, did that, do you think that that set some expectations for you when you came up when you're a junior that everyone is kind of like, oh, this is Dan Carey's kid. Like she's going to be good or whatever. Yeah, I do think there was a little bit of that. I think I was maybe a little more sheltered from it than say, uh, Daly and Liz Peters because Vic was a skip. Right. So because my dad played third, he was a little bit less known, but I definitely think that the name always was there. Like it was always a thing that was talked about. They never mentioned me and my results in a bond spiel without saying daughter of 1992 Briar champion, blah, blah, blah. I was in every single one and they would often interview him and me. Right. We'd okay. win a game. Newspaper guy would come to me, interview me, and then he'd get my dad and interview my dad about the fact that we won. So it was very much intertwined my whole life. Right. And did that piss you off? No, I thought it was great, but it, I, well, it never really occurred to me at the time that it was creating pressure, but it probably was. Right. Okay. So, so you didn't, so this was never anything you consciously thought about like, oh, dad, like maybe don't do an interview this time or dad, like I feel like it's, I feel some pressure because I'm your daughter. Like that was never anything that you consciously thought about. I think I knew that there was expectations and I don't remember ever having a huge problem with it. It it was there, but it it never bothered me that he, like I always liked him being involved. He was also coaching me for a lot of it. So of course they're going to interview him. Like he's part of the team team. too. Yeah. Yeah. So I never felt slighted by them interviewing him, but definitely think that there was some pressure there because of what, especially for the first few years right after, like in the, in the mid late nineties when he was still, one of the top teams, that part of my career. And I was still very young then, but the expectations for the next little bit were higher. And then once you get a few years removed and he stops curling in 99 and, you know, so by the time I was done juniors at 05, it was a little bit less top of mind because it had been a while since the last time he played. So that's good. So it didn't, so it affected you, but maybe not something that you had to consciously deal with. Yeah, no, I never remember it being a big hurdle. I, I knew it was there and I knew that there was expectation levels, but I mean, nobody expects anything of me that I don't expect. Like I have higher expectations for myself than anyone else has for. So it never was something that bothered me. It was my own head that I had to deal with versus other people's stuff. Right. Fair enough. And so talk to me a little bit. And I promise this interview is not going to be about your dad. (laughs) You're like, Oh God, everyone asks me about my dad. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Uh, But you did talk about him being your coach and he still does coach you on occasion. What's that like? Because I, I feel like, and I'm sure you've talked about this before, but but I, I want to get into like, how does it, does it affect you off the ice at all? Because I feel like, you know, you're a pretty fiery competitor and I feel like your dad is quite similar. So how was there ever like a really tough conversation you guys had to have where, you know, it's like, we got to leave this on the ice when we get off the ice. Like, how do you think it's sort of affected your overall relationship with your dad? him being so closely related to you. In, I actually in curling. mostly think it was very good, but certainly there was tough conversations. It wasn't the the one that comes to mind as far as the really tough conversation that we had to have didn't happen on the ice. It was when I was finishing juniors and moving into women's and juniors. I'm going to sound like all the adults that drive me crazy. Juniors was different when I was in juniors. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we played two, three events a year max. That's all there was right. uh, for junior spiels and you, and you played a league and then that was kind of it. So it wasn't practicing every day and it wasn't big sponsorship. Like we would get a hundred and two hundred dollars for sponsors and that yeah. was it. And that's all you needed that's really. <laughs> when our parents would pay for hotel rooms. And I mean, that's just yeah. how it was. There was yeah. no money. It was hard enough to get money for actual competitive adult curlers. So, um, it was just way different. So when I was leaving juniors and going into women's, I was trying to find a team and I was getting frustrated because I felt like I was a pretty good player. And yes, I never won in juniors, but you know, I was, I felt like I was fairly highly regarded and I couldn't find a team that I, that was the level I was expecting to be able to be at. Yeah. And he sat me down and he said, look, here's the deal. You're not working as hard as the people who are on these women's teams. And I looked at him and I kind of didn't know what to say or do. And he said, like, you've got to practice every day. That's what it takes to to do this at, at this level. And I said, well, I can't practice every day. I got university and I got this and that and what the other. And he said, look, I'm not telling you 
that you better go practice every day. I'm saying your actions don't align with your words. So if you want to get on these kinds of teams, then that's how you get there. I don't care if you do or don't. Like if you want to focus on university, that's fine with me. But here's like you have to pick one because right. you can't complain about it and then not put the work in. And so I got mad at him and I left the room, which is pretty much how most of our, he'll tell you that anytime he tried to do a correction, it's uh, and we've funny, we've done a bunch of personality um, analysis, like Myers-Briggs type stuff since then. Yeah. And uh, it, it all aligns very much with what my dad learned to do very quickly with me, which they call hit and run. Like if you're, if the J is the last letter in your type, yeah. then you don't like things that aren't on your list. Unexpected things are not something that you take kindly to. And so he would give me something that was not expected and then he would leave me alone for a while because as soon as I had time to process it and get it on my list, then it was okay. And I would listen to him and I would do it. But my initial reaction was all the reasons why I can't do that. Why it's not going to work because it's not in my plan. So anyway, that's what happened. And I, I, he left me alone for a bit and then I never, we never really talked about it again, but I started going to practice every day. Like you just, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And I knew he was right because I watched him go to practice every day when he was winning. So I knew I had to. And so I figured out a way to do it. I scheduled my classes around being able to go to, at the time was Fort Rouge in Winnipeg, um, on a break or, or after class or whatever. And I threw rocks every day and I've been doing it ever since. Right. So was there ever, so you never had to have that, like, like, have you ever had a moment where something happened on the ice or, or I guess your dad's not on the ice, but in the coaching realm, coaching to player realm that you had to, that bled into the off ice or were you always good at putting that? line in the sand we were pretty good at putting the line in the sand for sure um there was one or two things where we kind of would talk about it and say okay you and i talking about this when it's just the two of us when the team's not here isn't isn't we can't do that right so we got to stop having those conversations when he was coaching because then he was so aware of what was going on in the team so it was just it was it was innocent in its intention we were just talking about curling but at some point we, we looked at each other and we, I went, I just don't think this is good. Like if we're, it, if it's a team discussion, it's a team discussion. You and I shouldn't be talking about it. And he was right. like, yeah, you're right. So then we had to kind of park that. And that really was only a one-time thing. And then after that, we were better about it and we were conscious of it. So then, you know, if it's conversation started to turn that way, we'd just be like, nope, we got to park this, you know, talk about the strategy or about a shot or whatever is fine. Cause that's just yeah. him and I talking. Sure. So for the most part, as far as our personal relationship, we were always really good at putting a line in there that it never was, never was, I was mad at something that he said in a timeout. And so, you know, that evening I was still mad at him all, all it, w- it was never like that for us. Right. So that's good. So did you find, so what's like, uh, what's one of the most or the most positive thing of having someone so close to you be your coach? Because I think a lot of people tend to think like, Ooh, that must be tough to deal with, but I'm sure there's really great things about it. What What's probably the, what's the best thing about it? I think the thing that I never actually really realized until he wasn't coaching me is how much he did for my mental state. He was very good and is very good at getting me into a good place without I, me really knowing he's doing it just by the things that he says and the way he talks and stuff. Right. Uh, and he knows me really well. And he's also very good at without ever having any actual training, like they, nobody was talking about sports psychology and stuff when he was playing. Sure. Um, but a lot of the things that I would learn in those classes with mental trainers and that kind of thing were things that my dad always told me. So it's something that he just is quite skilled at. And so he was very good at getting me to a good place. And and that bleeds into performance. And what I found out pretty quickly when he wasn't coaching me is that I had to do it. And I didn't really know how much I had to work at it because I've never really had to, cause he was just there. So that was, and I mean, I think it was good for me. It was a growth thing for me to a learn that and b figure out how to do it for myself or rely on other people that aren't him to help me with it. But definitely he always was able to do that for me. And that was something that, like I said, I didn't even really realize how valuable it was until I didn't have it anymore. Right. And did ever, did it ever create a tension on a team? Was there ever a team where it was like, oh, there go Chelsea and Dan off doing their own thing and they're just leaving us in the dust. Was that ever a, a, was that ever a thing? Yeah, it's been a thing occasionally. Most of the time, not. Um, most of my former teammates and and my dad, you know, are still they still talk. They still hang out, whatever. Right. There was there was it, it there was one team that it bothered and and that team didn't last very long, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, but I mean, after and, and it was never that I like, you know, he didn't coach us the last couple of years, really. And so it's not that I couldn't, that I was married to him having to be the coach. But once he was, then I wasn't prepared to 
and like, cause we all went in right. knowing, but I, but I do understand it can be challenging for teammates, especially cause we are so close right. that they have to feel like he's their coach too. And I, like I said, I think most of my teammates have felt that way, but it, it certainly has come up with the odd teammate that it's just, it bothers them that, yeah, that the two of us are having, but it's not that everybody's not invited to breakfast, but right. <laughs> if he and I just go to breakfast together, then I'm like, okay, but we told you we were going like you could have come too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It, yeah. It, it occasionally was, but most of the time not. Um, it, I think it's just, it, it just was, and certainly it was the best thing for me, but I also think that, that he's pretty good. I mean, he coached, then he coached Reed after that for a couple of years. Like it's right. not that he isn't a good coach. So I think at the end of the day, because he's a good coach, it didn't end up being an issue all the time. And certainly it wasn't, if anything, he tends to be harder on me versus easier as right. far. So it wasn't preferential treatment and things like that. I don't think because of the nature of our relationship is that he would be more critical of me often than of my teammates. Right. So let's go back to, you were talking about playing juniors in Manitoba and all that kind of thing. And I think most people would look at where you are now and, and they look back and maybe they would be surprised at how long it took you to get going. Like you, you never won a junior provincial took you a while in women's uh, like a long while. Was that how much did that weigh on you? Not, not winning, not ever winning the province, uh, you know, in your first, like however many years of playing competitively. The, uh, when we got knocked out of my last junior provincials, when I was aging out, I was devastated. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, the answer to that again, because it was different for my dad and it was different for me. Like he, my dad would say to me, nobody cares who won juniors and that's yeah. not true now, but it, it was still not totally true then, but it didn't really matter as much as now it does as far as the feeder right. system goes and things well, like that. Well, and there that. were a lot of good players that, that did well, that didn't like Dave Neto in exactly. guy, you know, he was always the example that got pointed to, to me because well, and, he, and he and I have had that conversation because right. he said, you know, like, don't worry about that. I didn't win. I, w- I didn't win anything either until I was in my kind of mid twenties. So, right. um, yeah, it, it did weigh on me. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah, we didn't win Manitoba, but, there's not been a single team more dominant in their provincial championship maybe ever than Jennifer Jones has been in Manitoba. So you're trying to get through the best team in the world at the time. And, and that was probably the best event they played in for them too. They just always won. So uh, we lost a couple finals to her. And, and I mean that it's, it's hard to even be mad about that. It's frustrating because you happen to live in that province and you got to get through her to get out. But you know, it's not for lack, at least you're losing to somebody that you respect as far as like they're, they're <laughs> right. the best team in the world. So you can't be that mad about losing to them, but yeah, it, it was. And when we finally won in 2014, um, it was so Kristen Foster and I had not won a provincial title. The other two had in juniors. And so they laughed at me when we got our jackets and they used to send them to you beforehand, but in, in 14, they had already stopped doing that. They, they met you at the hotel but the, your jacket didn't meet you at the hotel. So the shirts were there. So that was exciting. But it just says, it's just letters. So it just says MB on the back. Like I wanted my Buffalo. That right. was always the thing. Sure. And so we didn't get the jackets until we got to practice. And so I put on my jacket with the Buffalo and I went running to the bathroom so that I could see it in the mirror. And I, I was just giddy. I, I was like a kid in a candy stars on cloud nine. Yeah. So, so it, it's interesting that you say that. Cause I feel like even if I was facing the best team in the world every year, there would be an element of like, Jesus Christ. Like, uh, why like w- like how do you stay motivated i guess in that in that situation knowing that you have this kind of unsur- potentially unsurmountable object in front of you well you got to think at some point if you keep working and keep getting better like we were we were still pretty young when we were losing to her so um it, it sort of was just and the other thing, because people told me I was crazy when I moved to Alberta, like, why wouldn't you move to an easier province? You moved to the only province that might be harder than the one you just came from. And I said, because my goal isn't to go to the Scotties. My goal is to win the Scotties when I go. Right. So I wanted to be prepared. And that's the thing about being in the province with with those kinds of teams and playing them regularly, especially when you're younger, is it makes you better. It's frustrating because you, you feel like you're donating your money and, and you get your butt kicked a few times and whatever. But you do get better from it. So that kind of competition breeds good teams and it breeds, you know, strong provinces. And so for me, I kept, that was my motivating factor is when I do win, cause eventually I will, I'll be able to contend. I won't be going to the Scotties the first time and going three and eight or whatever, right. because we'll feel ready. And we will, and we, we'd want, by the time we went to the Scotties, we'd want to slam. Right. So it's not like we weren't prepared to face the teams that we were playing there. And, and we finished second after the round robin and we medaled. So yeah. in our first, in all of our first rookie, like our rookie um, time there. So yeah, I mean that, that was always for me, 
more what I had in mind. So I would, was prepared to put up with the frustration of having to figure out how to beat her or beat the other. And I mean, it wasn't just her. I mean, at yeah, one point, of course, a lot of great teams. Yeah. At one yeah. point there was, I think three of us in the top five when Kathy was skipping sure. another team. Yeah. Um, so to, to beat those kinds of teams and get out of a province that is hard to get out of that, I would be better prepared to perform well at the Canadian championship when I did eventually get there. Right. And so did you feel, cause so you went in 2014 and Jennifer's not there. Right. Did that did that bother you at, at all? Because it certainly was something that people talked about. Uh, did it bother you that you didn't get the chance, at least in, in that moment, to sort of slay the dragon, as it were? At that point, I was just happy to get there any way I could get there. Because the reality is she wasn't in the province every year either because she kept winning Canada. So right. she was Team Canada a bunch of the time. So she was probably in the provincial probably more than half the time I was in it, but n- not every year. Right. Um. So no, I don't think so. I do know that it, that I really wanted to prove that we belong there, that it wasn't just because she wasn't in the province. And I remember saying that in an interview at the end of the week, like the bronze isn't what we had in mind. And we really wanted a chance at the gold, especially because, you know, we were in the one, two game. So to lose one, two game and the semifinal was tough. But I said, I think we proved that we belong here and that it's not just because Jennifer wasn't in the province with, you know, if you looked at how we played all week. So that was important to me to, I didn't care that she wasn't there, but I wanted to show everybody that that wasn't the reason that we were able to win and then able to contend at the Scotties. Right. So did any of that chatter, did that bother you? Were you aware of it when people were like, oh, well, you know, Jennifer's not there. So that's why she won. Like, I mean, because obviously at the end of the week, no one could reasonably say to you that. But like you said, you did kind of have to prove yourself. If you went to the Scotties and went four and seven, people might have been like, oh, okay, well. Too bad Jennifer wasn't here, you know, but so were, was that chatter that you were aware of? Did that bother you at all or was it easy to just... It wasn't easy, you know, because I, yeah, you know what's going on, but I mean, that's like anything, right? There's, I, I don't think you go to an event where there isn't something that's being talked about that you have to park. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just, there's always that. So if, you, if that kind of stuff bothers you, and, and for me, I felt with the Jennifer thing in particular, A, very prepared um, to, to prove ourselves with that team. We'd been through a lot and we'd put in the work and we knew we were ready. Uh, and B, it motivated me to not want to not be that team, to not be, you know, go four and seven and have people say, like, I wanted exactly what you said. I wanted at the end of the week for there to be no reasonable way that you could say, well, it's too bad right. that she wasn't here. So you, so then you moved to Alberta and, you know, you strike me as someone who is very proud of being Manitoban and from Winnipeg, like you say, you put the buffalo on. It's a very emotional and giddy moment for you. Uh, like why Alberta? How did you make that pivot? I mean, I know your team was kind of done or whatever, maybe, but how did that emerge as like your best option or what you thought was your best option? Like what was the thought behind moving here? Well, it was just looking around at, at the players available and who I thought had kind of the same goals as me of a four year cycle and the kind of, the kind of work I wanted to put in and I wanted, you know, to be matched by my teammates and all that kind of stuff and, you know, build something over a four year cycle. So I knew my current team was parting ways, just different life things. Christy and and Christy was having a baby and Lindsay was getting married and going to have babies and stuff. And so fine. Um, And there was never any bad blood there. I still see them every time I'm in Winnipeg. We're all still really good friends. So it wasn't that, but I knew I needed a new team. And I, yeah, just looking around, I had my, my gut feeling was that it was the best thing to do. And I, I wasn't, I didn't intend to move. I didn't intend to leave Winnipeg, but I, you know, and my parents were upset <laughs> that, I was, <laughs> that I was leaving. And I said, well, but you guys like this, this is my chance to do this because I'm not married. I don't have a job here because my job at the time had given me an ultimatum that earlier that year of the Olympic trials. And so I quit. So I didn't have a job. I didn't have, I'd already sold my condo after I, so there was nothing holding me there. And so if I was ever going to do it and sort of take a leap, that was the time. Uh, and obviously my instincts weren't right because the <laughs> team that I moved forward obviously didn't, didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you know, it, it, it was just at, at the time, it, see, like I don't regret it because I thought it was my best option and I went for it. And I mean, that's all you can do. You know, there's no guarantee that a team's going to work, especially when, um, you know, the first year of a cycle and you don't really know each other that well. It's right. it's always a bit of a guessing game as to whether or not it's going to work, but you got to take a chance and, and put together what you think is your best option and then hope that it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Then you go, I mean, I ended up putting the Scotties the following year. So it, 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 there's, there's always, there's usually something good that comes out of going after what you want. So what is it with curling in Alberta? Cause it seems like at least on the women's side, especially it's just like a bloodbath every year. You know, it's like you talked about, you move here, you have this great hopes for this team. It blows up after one year, you essentially played four years with three different lineups or at least at one player changing or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
what is it with curling here? Why is it, uh, especially like this off season? I mean, it was insane. Like, so is there something about being a, a ladies curler in, in Alberta that causes that? I don't think so, but I, but actually it's interesting this year because now everybody's playing out of Manitoba. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so They're all moving gone, over. Yeah. yeah. So all, a lot of the, not all, I mean, there's still three or four top teams in Alberta that are, that are left, but a lot of the depth in Alberta has now gone to Manitoba. Like the Manitoba provincial this year is going to be a bloodbath because right. of all the top teams that are now based out of there. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of switches around, which is interesting. Um, I remember when we first announced the team and, and everybody else was announcing their teams and where they were going to play out of Jason Gunlickson. I saw him at a mixed doubles event and he said, you're the best GM in curling. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, not only did you put together a great team for yourself, you got everybody else to leave the province like mass <laughs> exodus. I was like, yeah, I guess I never really thought of it that way. <laughs> so yeah, no, I mean, but it is, it's, it, it has been tough. It's, it became one of the deepest provinces, you know, quite a while ago. And, yeah. and still, even with all those teams now playing out of Manitoba, there's still a lot of depth in Alberta. So I'm sure it'll be tough again this year, but um, it's just, again, it's, I think it's the same kind of thing. There's a pretty good tour in Alberta. There's two major cities. So you're driving distance to a lot of places with pretty good spiels yeah. and getting to play against good teams makes more breeds, more good teams. So the deep provinces tend to get deeper. It's a rich get richer situation because they, you can play against each other all the time without having to spend the money to travel, which uh, when you're younger is important. Yeah, no, I mean, you smoked your lamp <laughs> with my elbow. My house Apparently, when you and I get together, lamps are not <laughs> safe. This episode of Stone and Straw is brought to you in part by Dynasty Curling. Dynasty Curling is a Canadian company that has been around since 2015, at changing the landscape of curling apparel both on and off the ice. And my team uses Dynasty. Uh, we're repping the Dynasty clothes out there. They're super comfortable, super nice. And and we're not the only ones who use them. Obviously, Olympic and world champions, Team Jennifer Jones, Team Chelsea Carey, Team Gushu, Team Adeen, Team Cooey, and many more. If you follow them on Twitter at Dynasty Curling, you can see they're an insanely good roster. But what a lot of people probably don't know is that Dynasty also creates a lot of curling products for off the ice as well. It could be hats and hoodies that just have the Dynasty logo on it, which look great. They have gear to support your favorite team or your favorite province at the Briar or the Scotties. And they also have workout gear, which is really cool too. So you should obviously check them out and uh, especially check out that apparel. You probably didn't know. You probably just think, oh, it's only this sublimated curling gear I see on the ice. No, they have awesome off ice stuff. And because they're really sweet, uh, they have a deal just for you for listening to this podcast. If you use the promo code Stone Straw at checkout, you'll get ten percent off your uh, any purchase you make of Dynasty Off Ice Apparel. So that's pretty amazing. So head on over to DynastyCurling dot com, enter in the promo code Stone Straw, and you'll get ten percent off your order of Dynasty Off Ice Apparel. And if you live in Winnipeg, they just opened a retail store, so you can check that out at the Granite Club in Winnipeg. Or check them out online at Dynasty Curling on Twitter, Instagram, uh, or DynastyCurling.com. I, I wanted to talk a little bit maybe more about, about you personally because I, you know, I feel like you, when it comes to teams, so you're in Manitoba, you basically play with the same team for six years. I mean, uh, one little change. But other than that, I mean, you're playing with Kristen for like eight years or whatever it was. You kind of stayed with the same team. Then you come to Alberta. Your lineups are changing all the time. Uh, why like what like what what was the change because I, I feel like there's there's become this perception that you're you're always your teams are going to be changing and that's you know people I think people point to you as the X factor in that just because you're a skip and it seems natural but you had this really long and great team before you've had these like lineups which is so what do you think has been has there been a change or is it just kind of circumstantial or I mean, I think it's mostly circumstantial. The, the first team obviously just wasn't a good fit. And that's, right. and I mean, the three of them were a good fit. They stayed and played together the rest of the time. I just didn't right. fit with them. Yeah. Um, and that happens. Like I said, that's just a difference in like, they were all quite a bit younger than me. They had different kind of views of the game than I do and, and approach things a different way. And we thought we could reconcile it and it just kind of didn't work. And so that is what it is. And then when I moved down to Calgary and joined this team, we obviously we talked about it being through the three year cycle. No one expected Amy to retire and that, sure. so that's circumstantial. I mean, that's not anything to do with the team. She's not, she's not curling anymore. She, she just yeah. had enough, which is fair. I mean, you've been doing it for a long time. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that was a circumstance. And then when we, when we put the team together as it was, it was, it was, you know, for the purpose of trials and Scotty's that year. So 
I played with Lady and Joss for three years. Like, so I still had long term right. teammates in there. It was True. just one player, right? So I just, yeah, it's just more, I guess, what I'm trying to get at it. I feel like it's more of a perception thing. Like, I feel like people have a perception of you that I don't feel is correct, but in terms of that, you know, that maybe you're difficult to play with. Do you feel like that's true? I think all skips are difficult to play with. <laughs> I, I honestly do. Okay. At a, at a top level, I try not to be any more difficult than anybody else, obviously, but. Um, I mean, I can't answer that. That's not, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do a good job and, and care about my teammates and whatever. And I've got long-term friendships with a lot of my ex-teammates. So I would right. say that I did okay with that. Sure. Do some people not like certain things about me? Sure. I don't like some things about teammates <laughs> I've had too. I mean, that's, that's sports. You're, you're spending a lot of time together and tensions can run high and people approach things differently. Some people are very stoic and they're very emotionless and all those things. I'm not that person and I never yeah. have been. So, um, can I, and everybody can move a little bit, but I can't become a different person. So if it's going to bother people that I wear my heart on my sleeve, then they're probably not a good fit for me. And that's okay. Yeah, it's right. not my fault. It's not their fault. I, I just think that you have to pick your teammates based on what, like you have to accept them for who they are. Sure. And so if, if it's something that's a deal breaker for you, then don't play with that person in the first place. Like don't expect them to change. It's like relationships. Like they say, you know, you see, you meet this person and you think they're great. I just wish that they would do this one thing different. Well, that's a recipe for disaster. Right. So it, I, 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 know, I agree with you completely. Like, I mean, you and I have been friends for a long time. I've always got along with you and I know tons of people that speak very highly of you. And it, it, so it was just weird to me because it's, I, I'm, I'm almost thinking more like publicly, like, because you, like you said, you wear your heart on your sleeve. You're a very emotional player. Uh, you interview very emotionally. You're very honest in interviews. Do you think that that being a confident woman shapes that perception sometimes that because I, I feel like there are people that I would say that curl that uh, have a reputation with fans that is incorrect because they're quiet. They don't really stir the boat or sorry, stir the pot. They don't stir the boat. I'm making up <laughs> new sayings here. They don't really stir the pot. Uh, and so I think fans go, Oh, well, they're like, they're so nice and they're so sweet and I love them and they're great and they can't do anything wrong. And I, and so do you feel like being a confident woman affects people's perception of you? Because I do think that you sometimes get unfairly maligned for being that person. Yeah. And I think the thing that frustrates me about that the most, honestly, is that they don't see the other stuff. Like they, everybody ignores the fact that when the other team makes a shot, I'm at the back raising my, my broom and, and, you know, congrats saying good shots to them as they go by. Nobody talks about that part. They talk about the fact that I missed my shot in six and slammed my broom. Well, that's me being mad at me. So, you know, I just, I've never, for me, I've always enjoyed listening to interviews and seeing athletes who are honest and who, who I hate canned answers and I hate, you know, the toe, the line, there's no I in team, all this stuff. I've, I've never been a person who's a fan of that type of athlete. If you are, you won't like me. Because right. I'm not that kind of athlete. And that's fine. I mean, you can't please everybody, no matter who you are. There's no way that everybody's going to like you. So for me, it's been more about just being the kind of athlete that I respect. Um, and that's, you know, being a, an intense competitor, but then still being a good sport and treating your opponents with respect. Um, and, and to me, as long as you're doing that, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with whatever emotional display there is, as long as you're not disrespecting the game or your opponents, then, right. which I, obviously I don't think I'm doing. Some people might think <laughs> I am, I guess, but in my mind, I'm, I'm upholding those things while still putting it all on the line, which is the only way I know how to play. Right. Do you think that that earns you more, um, intense fans, like, or not intense, but like, do you think that that earns you like the people who do see that in you and do respect that in you? Do you almost feel like they're a greater fan of you, if that makes sense. Yeah, maybe. I never really thought about that. And, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm not the, I'm not that person that, that, you know, sunshines and rainbows and whatever. So it, I'm probably harder to like than somebody who is that way, but I don't like people who are that way. So, right, right. so I, not that I don't like them, but they're not the kind of, like, I don't love listening to those interviews. Like sure. I don't go out of my way to tune in and, and listen to that type yeah. of Oh, yeah, it was fine. Like we tried. You exactly. Know, yeah. Like that's not what, um, like I love, I mean, obviously I'm a huge Jets fan. I love listening to Blake Wheeler interview because right. he's, he's authentic and he's not disrespecting anybody or anything, but he tells you what happened and he tells you he's upset about it and he tells you it's not acceptable. And yeah, we got to talk about them. We got to do whatever. And I, that, so that's the kind of player who I will go out of my way to find his interview, his post game. Right. Because I like that. So I try to be that way as well, but it doesn't mean that you, that you can, that you 
have to be disrespectful or or whatever. But I think that's that people just assume when they see emotional outbursts, they just associate that with being disrespectful of of the opponent or whatever. And it really has nothing to do with that. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's the thing that I think too, is like, I, I, I think a lot of this is being based on what happens in the public. And so I think the thing for me is like, I feel like having known you now for however many years, five or six years, you're always the same. And some people are not, they have a camera face and then they have a behind the scenes face and their camera face is great. And their behind the scenes face, not so great. So then it's like, so I feel like does, does that ever frustrate you? Do you ever feel like, and I I realize I'm making it sound like you're some kind of villain, which you're not at all. I just, these are just like things that, you know, I've picked up over the last few years as you've done a lot better and you've been more in the public eye. Does that ever bother you that there are some people who are maybe getting credit for being this kind of amazing person when maybe you know that like they're not? Uh, I don't think I would say it bothers me just because it would be different if my goal were to get everybody to like me. And then if that were the case, I would alter my behavior. And that's not something that I find worthwhile. I'm just, I just want to be myself. And so I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm, I know who I am and I know that I'm being true to myself. And if other people choose not to do that, then that's their choice. It's not how I would want to operate. Um, So I have no, no jealousy or anything of that just because it's not how I would choose. And there are some people who are just genuinely that person where they're, you think that their on camera persona has to be phony and it's not like they just oh, really for are. Sure. They just so that really exists are the sweetest. Too, yeah. But I, and so that's fine. Like I'm not faulting the, because of they're course. still being themselves. Yeah. It's, but having the two, and I mean, there's some level of it that you have to have. Of Everybody course. has yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's a professionalism an, thing. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm not saying that, but to, to be totally different person is not something that I would ever want to do. So right. if other people choose to do that, then good for you. But it, like for me, that sounds way worse than some people saying that they don't like me. Right. No. And, and that's great. I, I, you, so you, so you're putting together a team this year. This is kind of the first team you've had to build from scratch in the last three years. Uh, so you, you've talked about, you know, all skips are difficult to play with. How much, uh, how important is team chemistry to you? Because you, you've said like, you know, I moved to Alberta, played with this team, it exploded. We weren't the right fit. Everybody kind of knew it wasn't the right fit after a certain amount of time and it was bad. So how do you kind of work on understanding team chemistry and knowing like, okay, this is who I want to play with and this is who I think I can fit with? Well, I think it's, I think it changes throughout your career a little bit in the sense of what you need at that time. So part of what I liked about the team that I'm putting together is that um, it, it would be hard to point to anybody who has more fun curling than Dana and Rochelle. Sure. And that's what I want. Um, it, it's just been, and I honestly, through most of my career, my, I, I love all my teammates that I've, that I've played with and I'm still good friends with a lot of them, but we often didn't have a natural person to be that, to, to lighten it up, to make a joke, to laugh at something, whatever. Often all of us were quite intense. And so right. that's okay, but it can be, it's nice to have somebody who naturally is that person. Uh, and because I haven't really had that in a while, I was excited about the prospect of, of having, you know, those and you two, have two, right. <laughs> Instead of just <laughs> having, one. Yeah. Having yeah. those two. So that was part of it for me was just wanting to go back to let's make, I mean, obviously we have big goals and we, we are going to work towards them, but it's the same. And Colin and I always talk about it in mixed doubles because we do poorly at doubles when we're, <laughs> when in his words, he's being a dick to me. <laughs> right. Um, and when we have fun and when we worry less about m- making shots, we make way more shots. Right. So for, we're always reminding each other after a bad end, like, Hey, let's not get bogged down here. Like keep it light. Let's, you know, we're get to play in an arena crowds all here. Like this is awesome. Yeah. So trying to keep that be the focus. And I have, I think that having teammates that are that way as people um, for me will be a nice change. Cause I just, quite frankly, it hasn't been that way. We've had lots of really intense personalities and it's worked really well for the most part, but I'm excited about the prospect of having kind of class clown type people <laughs> yeah. on a team. Cause it's just, I don't remember the last time I really had somebody like that. So what causes that pivot for you? Because like you said, you had a team of mostly intense people for the last three seasons and that's been the most successful period of your career. So where so where or why does that pivot happen now that you think like I mean, because obviously Dana and Rochelle are intense players and they want to win yep. and obviously everyone knows that it was not to say that they they are not great curlers but what was that pivot for you why did it come to that sort of oh, I think this is what something I want more of well it's just uh, the the Olympic cycles are tiring especially at the end and so because of all the and, and I mean mine was 
probably as tiring as anybody's just because like I, I moved to two different cities. I had all kinds of different commutations, combinations and permutations of teams totally in a four year cycle. So I just think I was tired at, at the end of it. And I've really enjoyed this off season and not really worrying about curling or thinking about <laughs> it. I hadn't been on the ice until last Saturday because I just needed a break. It was just a lot. Yeah, totally. And so because of that, I think I kind of went like, I want to make sure I'm going to enjoy this again. Um, not that I didn't enjoy it, but it's you're you're it's different when you're with all intense players and it just can be tiring because it's just all intensity all the time all the time. Yeah. Well, and it's managing it too, because everybody being intense like that can snap at any minute. Right. Right. So without having somebody to naturally be that person who kind of breaks the tension, you're, you're battling it all the time. And and everybody has to kind of step into that role at some point, even though it's not their natural tendency to do that. And having to step into a role that's not your tendency is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And it can be draining. Right. So for me, it was more just, I, I mean, I, it started as thinking about them as players, of but course. then when I was yeah. deciding between, cause I was talking to a number of, of different teams, sure. you know, that they were one of, it was just a factor because everybody was good players. So I was talking to all yeah. these people that I thought were pretty equally skilled and thinking what, what, so it was partially that. And it was partially, we sat down and talked about, like I said, I, to me, you have to pick what's going to differentiate you in four years and reverse engineer that. Right. Four years backwards. So, you know, if you look at Rachel Holman, not that they can't draw, but their differentiating factor is, is big weight. Right. You know, 10 rotations and run backs and whatever. They're the best women's team in the world at that. Probably certainly one of them. Jennifer's is draw weight. They're one of the best drawing teams in the world. She herself is maybe the best drawer in, in curling yeah. of, of either gender. So, you know, that's their thing. So what is it like pick a thing? And so we talked about that and, and, you know, talked about a few options and things that I, that we thought could kind of work, but they were all on board with that. And that for me was a big thing. Like let's decide in four years what we think. And it's still, there's no, obviously there's no guarantee of course. that it's going to work. But I think rather than just try to get better at throwing the rock, you need to figure out what the fine skills are that you're going to really focus on and excel at relative to other teams, because everybody's a good enough rock thrower yeah. at this level. So uh, yeah. that's not, you know, and it's not that you can, uh, abandoned technical practice, but what are, what other things, like what are the little, those little tiny differentiating factors, you know, that gives you the extra quarter inch you need in that, in that moment? Like, what is that? So that was, uh, and, and it's not for me, it wasn't even about what it is. It's about, that's the thought process. Like we need to sit down and identify, you know, two or three things that we want to own, that this is going to be our identity as a team and then figure out how to do it. And they were all totally on board. And and that for me was the moment where I was like, yeah, I think this is the way I'm going to go. So you think that that's going to make you a better player? Uh, yeah. And I think that, I think that it's the only way you win. Um, you know, and I, I think you've, we've seen that in the last couple of, couple of uh, teams that we've sent. And so I just think it's, something that I've never really done. I've never approached it that way. I, we always did all the normal stuff and, and the more the year of the brooms actually, I think maybe was a bit of what pointed that out to me was because we spent a lot of time on learning that. Yeah. Um, and obviously got benefits from it because we spent the time learning how to do it. I, I don't think I'm sure Jocelyn and Lainey would both tell you that they've never thrown fewer rocks in a season than they did in that one. And I've never thrown more because right. I would just throw and throw and throw and throw and, and try throw. and see what you can do. And they would do different things with the brooms. And I mean, we never said that they should be allowed. They shouldn't. And and they're not anymore. And we supported that. It was never us saying that, like fighting for them to stay. But yeah, the reality but if they're was, allowed, you right. have to do it because <laughs> somebody yeah. else is going to. Yeah. So we that kind of was a shift for me going, OK, like we we chose to do something non-traditional and it. I mean, it worked because the equipment was too good, but it worked because we put the time into it. Right. The equipment was... You identified a thing yes. and you worked on that thing. The equipment was the same for everybody, but we'd watch people do it and I'd be like, your angle is completely wrong. Like you're making that rock go straight and you think you're making a curl. Right. But I knew that because of the time we put in. Um, so I think that that was kind of what did that for me where I went, okay, this is what we need to do. And it's obviously not that anymore because the equipment's not the same, but what is it that we can pick up that maybe nobody's quite as focused on as we will be? Right. And so, okay, so let's shift the focus away from this upcoming year. And let's talk a little bit about last year. When you sit back now, we're in August. Do you view last season as successful or not so successful? I think it's hard not to view it as successful. I mean, it's the it's the best season I've probably ever been part of as far as consistency and and winning on tour and all that stuff. I mean, we, we got heartbroken a couple times, but we put ourselves in a position to get our hearts broken by being really good that week, you know? Right. So yeah, it's disappointing. And it, it like losing the Olympic trials final is the hardest game I've ever lost. But when we talked about it after 
all of us kind of said that we wouldn't have changed anything about what we did going in. And, you know, we, we were calm and we were ready and it didn't go our way, but that's sport. Right. So I don't have any regrets about it in the sense that I don't feel like it was for lack of preparation or it was for, you know, we, we didn't get ourselves in a good place mentally. Like I think we did everything we could and it just wasn't our day. Right. So it, it's a little easier to swallow when that, like in some ways it's easier to swallow when that's the case. So the Scotties was disappointing, obviously the wild card game, but the wild card game is tough. Yeah. It's like, one game. <laughs> well, and it's two teams that like good chance that whoever comes out of it is going to content. Well, and look at how carried it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so. And, and so that was, so it's a tough game to play. And so we didn't obviously play our best there and that was unfortunate, but um, it, it's going to, even if we played incredible, we could have, I mean, there it's two really good teams, right? So yeah. it's, again, it's hard to be, to beat ourselves up too much about that. Um, and and then, yeah, I mean, players was disappointing. But other than that, that was the first time we missed the playoffs in any event we played in all year was the players right. championship in April. So it's really it's hard to be disappointed. It was a first slam for everybody. But Kathy, um, Jocelyn Laney and myself won our first slam that this past year. I mean, it, I think it's a success. I, I think that there's heartbreaking moments, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a successful season. It was incredibly successful, actually. Right. OK, so so the I want to talk about the Olympic trials specifically because, yeah, as you said, you lo- you lose the final. Does it and like we've said a lot and everyone knows it's a tremendous amount of work that goes into getting to the Olympic trials. Does it does coming second change your perception of all of that work? Like, like, I guess it's like that age old question. Like, if I can't win, I'd rather come last. Do yeah, you think that's true? I don't. Um, the Olympic trials before that, we went, we had a chance to if we win our last round robin game, we would have been five and two and in second place and we lost it. And so we, we lost to Sherry Madon and and because we lost, we both ended up four and three and played them again again in a tiebreaker and lost the tiebreaker. I would take, I mean, as heartbreaking as losing the final was it's one game and we had a great week where there's a lot more moments in the other trials where I go, like we should have done this there. We should have done that there. So as far as your, your regret and just wondering, well, what if we would have, what if we would have done this? And I don't have any what, what ifs about this, this trials, just because I don't think we could have done anything different leading right. into the final. So we gave ourselves the best chance we could to win and it didn't go our way, but I feel a lot less questions in my head. I mean, watching the Olympics was hard because we of were course. so close to being there, yeah. but, um, but I don't feel, I don't feel a sense of what if the, the same way I did after the 13 trials. So it so it was a sense of when it was over, you felt like, okay, we probably were the second best team. I don't know if I would say that. I think, I mean, it's hard to argue that we weren't the best team all week when we were undefeated. Right. Um, But you can't say that Rachel's team wasn't prepared to go to the Olympics. I mean, if you, if you were picking three or four years ago, they would have been, it would have been Jennifer and Rachel. Everybody knows that. I'm not, I'm not ignorant to that by any stretch of the imagination. I do think that week that for the most part, we were the best team, but I mean, finals are finals. Like, yeah, that's just, that's how it goes. So um, yeah, certainly there was no, there was no feeling of, well, you know, and, and I got those messages during the Olympics. Well, you would have done better. I'm like, I don't know that it would have done better. They were more prepared, probably as prepared or more prepared than anyone to go. Right. So who knows? I mean, maybe we would have, maybe we wouldn't, but you can't say that. Like, that's not fair to them to make that comment. And so everybody kept sending me those messages. And I was like, you just guys, like you, you can't say that. Right. Well, and I said that too, you know, when, when the, when things are not going well in the Olympics, I was like, and you nailed it. Like if we were going to hand pick a team, if we were Sweden or China or Korea and we're just saying, okay, you're, you're going, Mm -hmm. we probably would have chose Rachel or Jennifer going into the year and Kevin. And so everybody was exactly sending me these messages saying like what happened. And I'm like, this is the first year really that we've sent probably the two favorites or certainly two of the favorites. Totally. In both men's and women's. And so, yeah, but it was bound to happen eventually that we weren't going to have all the success we've been having. So with the world being the way it is and and all the catching up and things. So, you know, everybody's going, well, we should have sent different teams. I'm like, you can't even make that argument. You can't. Because, you know, like you said, I mean, those two are two of the teams, if not the two teams, that if you sat back and just went, it's you, it's probably Gushu or Kui and it's probably Jones or Homan. Yeah. So you know, it, it was, it certainly wasn't for lack of preparation on the part of the teams. Yeah. That wasn't the cause of, of what happened by sure. any stretch is all I kept saying to people. Cause that's all I know about it. I, what I can guarantee you is that that's not why, right. I can't say what is why <laughs> yeah, we're not there, but it's we not because yeah. of the lack of preparation. Yeah, no, that, and, and that's exactly right. And, and that's how I feel too. So, so to sum it up, it, you feel like the Olympic trials, you did everything that you could control. Yes. And then there was just, there just happened to be on the day 
you were the second best team in the game yep. in the one game. One well, and yeah, I mean the ice was a little different for us. We maybe didn't catch it, you know, it was straighter and they play a semifinal on that sheet and, and you right. know, we sit and so there's that old argument always about well, do you want the bite of the final or not? And you right. do because you don't know if you're gonna win of the course. semi. Yeah. But if you knew you were gonna win the semi, you're better off playing it. So that hurt us in the first end on my blank. I mean, I we none of us thought I threw it bad enough to miss it and just it it was way straighter. So yeah. and then because it was way straighter, once once they get a lead. They're yeah, one they're of the best peeling teams in the world. Amazing, and yeah. Peels on straight ice are, are easier than they are on ice that moves. So it just, we got down to a team, which in the conditions and the circumstances, you just can't get down to them. Right. And so we still had a chance. I mean, I, I try to, you know, double to tie the game and go to an extra and you never know. So yeah, it just, I don't think that we, between our last round Robin game and the, and the final, it, it went better than I could have ever expected it to go for the fact that, you know, you were we, there and one. Well, yeah. And I mean, We've been in big games, but in an Olympic trials, like I've not been to an Olympic trials final before. No, that's that's so, arguably the biggest game. Right. So as far as for, for people with relative lack of experience in that particular game, I thought that we were like, it, it was actually quite unbelievable how well we did with it, how calm everybody was and how focused on the process we were versus outcome. Like all of that stuff felt really good. So I don't, um, it, not that I that it didn't crush me to lose that game. It did. Of course. But I don't feel like in that week, we could have been any better prepared for that final. Right. And so how do you, how do you go to mixed doubles after that? <laughs> because it was very quickly after. And, uh, you know, it, I can only imagine that must have been insanely hard to do. It was hard, but it, you know, it's also another chance. So it, in some ways it softens the blow a little bit because your, your hopes of going to the Olympics aren't over yet. Right. You got another chance at it. So that's how I tried to look at it. it I mean, I would have liked more time in between them. Yeah. Um, and we had two and a half weeks. It wasn't like it was right away, but right. It, you know, after losing a game like that, two and a half weeks, isn't actually that much time to kind of, no, I and, can't imagine it would be at all. <laughs> and switch. Like I didn't feel like going to practice. I didn't feel, you know, you're, you're yeah. still in that kind of state of, of mourning a little bit, but it was easier to do because you kind of went, okay, well, yeah, that, that was awful, but we were that close and we did all the right things and we felt like we were really, really well prepared. So let's go seize this other, this new opportunity to go. It's still the, it was still another chance to go to the Olympics. So losing at doubles actually in some ways was harder because then it was over. Cause then it's over. Yeah. And so do you bring those experiences you talked about being in the trials final and, and all the things that come with it? Is that something that you think now is just going to set you up even better for this? Yeah, I, I think heartbreak. I know it's a totally different team, but yeah, but I, but I, I mean, it's, it's the old cliche, but I, but I really believe it's true is that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I think those heartbreaking losses and I mean, losing the Manitoba final that many times, certainly we learned a lot from that. Uh, and when we finally won, the sense of accomplishment was greater because we knew how hard it was to win and because we'd been on the other side of it. So I think that you learn a lot from those. And I think that it does make it sweeter if, you know, if, and when you actually do win and you kind of look back at that experience with a little bit fonder versus the, the kind of pain that's there initially. Right. And so I want to talk about Dana and Rochelle. This is kind of a fun, a fun one. Uh, so this year, your team totally dominated their team. You guys went five and one against team sweeting this year. Are there things that you notice about their game? Like you played them six times. Are there things that you actually, as a skip, are thinking like, hmm, I want to work with them on that? Oh, for sure. And I think that they think that about me too. Of I course. Mean, that's, they had a lot of success against you before that. Before that, so. yeah. Absolutely. And so, I, yeah, I think that's mutual. I think that's the case with anybody when you play. Like we're all just so familiar with each other right. that... Um, that you go, I love the way they do this. And I wonder if they would ever switch this to be the way that I like, I think the way that we do this is better or whatever. Yeah. Um, because we both have been coached by kind of Rob Kreps, Jeff Hoffert. We, we actually, it's all pretty similar as far as game plan and, and release and the technical piece. So right. that's helpful, but we do laugh about it because they beat, uh, well, they beat my team at the time in a provincial final in 15. And, yeah. and then we beat them in the final when we went in 16. And so, you know, they talk about 2015 with all these great memories and I'm bitter about it. And then I talk about 2016 and they get all mad and they're like, they go, well, we can't wait until we win something together so that we can actually have like a mutual happy memory because Just a it was basically at, at one's detriment was the other one's gain for the last three, four years. So right. yeah, we're, we're excited to hopefully 
turn that story around a bit. So are those actually conversations that you have where you go, okay, this is a thing I specifically noticed you do that I feel like we can do better. Is that is that something you specifically bring up or is it just kind of an organic thing that just sort of gets worked out? Yeah, we haven't been on the ice together. So as far as te- right. the, and the, like I said, the game plan stuff's been pretty easy. There's been a few that are a bit different and you know, I'd go, well, this is how we did it. What did you guys do? And then we kind of decide which we think works better. Um, so far it's been pretty seamless as far as that stuff goes. And like I said, I think the technical piece and even with Sarah too, cause she came and moved to Edmonton to work with Rob. So right. she's been coached by, which has kind of the same. So I remember playing in the Everest event last year and Dana was on my team, uh, and Ben Hebert was our yep. lead and Ben found my throw hard to read because I add at the end on draws right. and, and Kevin doesn't do that. And Dana found it very easy to read because Val does do that. Like, right. so a lot of it is, is actually, I think will be fairly seamless just because of that. And for me to read their throws from the far end, because we already throw it more similarly than new teammates probably typically would. Right. So that's, uh, so we're, we're nearing the end here and I, I want to talk a little bit about expectations. We sort of touched on it a little bit four years from now for, for having a conversation. What aside from like going to the Olympics, let's just say like, what are your expectations and and how do you set expectations for four years? It seems like a very tough thing to do. Well, and I don't know that we've even really, we haven't really talked about that. I mean, I think given what they've gone through and and a little bit less Sarah, the last couple of years, she hasn't played as much as we have, but she still went to a Scotties. Um, Obviously for Dana and Rochelle, they would like to win a Scotties because they've been so close and and that kind of thing. And I mean, I would love to do it again. Of course. Uh, I mean, (laughs) yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I would, just do, would be doing this if I didn't want to win. It I just again. don't really care about the Scotties yeah. at all. Like, I mean, I want to go to the Olympics, but like Scotties are like, whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's that. So everybody I, I think is in a, a similar situation just because we've actually had pretty similar experiences and, you know, some success, but some heartbreaking losses. And, and so there's, so there's a commonality in, in the things that we feel we still have left to do, obviously. Um, they've had more success than I have in my career in the slams. And so finally winning a slam, like I would like to keep that going. That was quite lovely. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a couple more of those would be good. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it, 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 we, we've, the three of us have been to continental cup and that was awesome. So we would all love to get back to that. So I just, we haven't, I, we don't ever, I don't, I think the reason we haven't talked about it is because it's sort of unspoken that we all want the same thing. So right. that part's been pretty easy. It's more about what are we going to do to get there? As right. our, our conversations have focused almost entirely on that. What are the steps? What, what's the, you know, what's the progression that we want to be seeing here? So aside from results four years from now, what's going to, what would make you the most happy if you're looking back, say, uh, assuming this team stays together for four years, looking back just personally from like a growth, a non result standpoint, what would be the ideal scenario for you? Um, I think that, like I said, a a part of my focus was just about, um, how like you, we give up so much to be able to do it. Um, and why am I doing it if I'm not enjoying it? Right. And not that I wasn't enjoying it, but like, let's, let's go out of our way to enjoy it and make sure like, that's why you started playing. Um, you know, because you loved it. Nobody started playing because they wanted to go to the Olympics. That's not why. No, you you were practicing and playing because you love to curl, and and you you forget. It's easy to forget that. Uh, so I think that, I mean, when you're losing, it's hard to have fun. But I think that if if you're having a reasonable run as far as doing fairly well, you don't have to be winning every event. But if you're consistently qualifying and having decent results, then for me, it would just be enjoying it and and figuring out ways to help each other when we're not like when somebody's having a bad day. And so you feel like you have that support system. I think that the biggest thing, the best feeling in the world is knowing that your team has your back, no matter what, that they believe in you, that they're, that they trust you and and you trust them. And that there's, there's something that's hard to replicate about that. And, and when you're in it, you know it, and it's awesome. And that's, so if, if I came out of four years having that feeling and that, you know, knowing that we did everything we could do and became the team we said we wanted to become, I mean, obviously I want the results, but at least I would feel like, you know, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. But we did that and we stuck to it and through it all, we were a team. We were supporting each other. We were building each other up instead of tearing each other down, which sometimes can be tough when it's when tensions are there and and, you know, things aren't going well. Well, I mean, that seems like a great way to finish. I mean, that seems like great <laughs> words for everybody to follow. I know I'm listening to that and I'm like, God, yeah, I've had a lot of years where I did not have fun at all. What was I doing? You know, um, so uh, to sign off, I'll give you a chance. You know, you want to plug some of your sponsors, your your team, you got some social media, whatever. This is your chance to 
throw down. Yeah, our, all our social media is under Team Carry Curl. So for Instagram and um, Twitter, it's at Team Carry Curl. And uh, yeah, Qualico is back on board with us as our main sponsor, which is very exciting. We're, I'm happy to have been involved with them for three or four years now, and they're a wonderful company. And they've been great to us. And we've got um, LPH and Burberry Farms and Hardline and Asham um, are back on board as well. So really excited for me. There, there's a couple long-term partners in there and, and for the other girls as well. Everybody kind of brought one of their long-term sponsors. So it should be a really good group and we're looking forward to it. Beautiful. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks to everyone for listening. This has been Stone and Straw. All right. I told you. What a great chat. Chelsea's just so open and honest and it's refreshing. I I think a lot of curlers are, but we don't get a chance to maybe... I say we like I talk to the media all the time. Um, (laughs) Curler, the curlers who are famous don't get a chance to necessarily show themselves. You know, a lot of the coverage on TV is just like 20 seconds after you win something, you know, Oh, Hey, how does it feel to win the briar? Oh, it feels pretty good. Okay, cool. You know, like I I feel like a lot of people don't get the chance to explain themselves. And I, I felt like Chelsea really took advantage of it. And she's certainly, as you can tell, not someone who is shy to share her opinions. And she's just, a great curler and a great person. And I hope you enjoyed that. As I say, you can, uh, you can follow Chelsea on Twitter at Chelsea D carry, and you can follow me on Twitter at Cullen, the curler. You can follow this podcast on Twitter at stone straw pod. Once again, share it, tell your friends, let everybody know, Hey, there's this new curling podcast out there. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you for all your feedback thus far, just directly to me. It means so much to me. And if there's things that you think would help the podcast or there's things that you want to see on this podcast, let me know. I'm always open for feedback. So make sure you, you do that. You rate and review the show on iTunes. Like I said, we made the iTunes charts this week, which was pretty fun. Uh, so if we can keep doing that, I would be more than thrilled. But most of all, like I say, just tell your friends and thank you to curling zone to dynasty to hardline to contributor, Matt Sussman to my graphic designer, Cody Audette to my theme songwriter, Graham Wright. I love you all. Thank you all for your contributions to this podcast. Once again, you can follow us on Twitter at stone straw pod next week's guest, Mark Kennedy. That's right. Uh, I had a chance to chat with Mark when I was in Alberta over the summertime and my goodness, you guys are going to love that chat. If you like the chat with John Morris, man, Mark and I had an amazing chat. We talked about Kevin Martin and some of the things that John said. I interviewed Mark after John. So we got a chance to talk about some of the things that John had said. We got to talk about the 2018 Olympics. Obviously, a lot of you have questions about that. And those of you that know Mark know he's an amazing guy. And I think you guys are going to really like that one. So come back next week. This is Stone and Straw Podcast. I'm John Cullen. We'll see you next week.